Thank you so much for joining us for our webcast today, The State of the Skills Gap, Connecting Education with Career Outcomes. My name is Kim Naraki, Coordinator for Events and Programs at WCET. As we go through today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box and we'll get, the, get to them during the Q&A portion. Sometimes if you put them in chat, we do lose track of them, so please be sure to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We are recording and we'll share that with you by the end of the week. We'll post a link to the slides so you can download those if you like, and you can follow our Twitter back channel using the hashtag WCET webcast. Today's webcast is hosted in partnership with our friends at Wiley Education Services. Um, they introduce us to today's panelists and we are grateful for their partnership and support. I also want to acknowledge our sponsor Vitac for making captional captioning available during the webcast. You can access those if you're interested. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to those when it's time. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today's webcast, who is probably a familiar face if you've been to other WCET events. Um, Megan Raymond, WCET's Senior Director of Programs and Membership. Over to you, Hi, Megan. everybody. Thank you, Kim, and thank you everyone for being here today. We really appreciate the participation and we look forward to the discussion and then the Q&A towards the end. So if this is your first WCET webcast, we're so glad to have you here. And if you're a familiar face, it's also good to see you too. I am the Senior Director of Programs and Membership and I've been with WCET. I'm just coming up on my 14th anniversary. So it's hard to believe it's been such a long and fun journey, but uh, the best part of my job is that I get to connect with really smart people doing amazing work across the country. And we even have members in Australia and Canada. So globally, I get to connect with really smart people. We have several of those people on with us today, and I'd like to go ahead and call on them to do a self-introduction. We'll start with Dr. Mark Austin, the Executive Director of Professional Education, and <clears throat> he's with Mason University. Excuse me. Mark. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate uh, spending time with you today. I'm Mark Austin, uh, Executive Director for um, Academic Innovation and New Ventures at George Mason, and I oversee a number of different areas, in particular, continuing in professional education. Excellent. And Dr. Deb Volzer, Senior Director of State and Workforce Development at Wiley. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here today. I uh, work with Wiley and our engagement with uh, state and workforce uh, agencies across the country. Excellent. And David? Yeah, hi, uh, David Kapranis. I'm our Director of Market Strategy and Research. Um, what I really like about my job is partnering with institutions, governments, other actors to help um, design and, and uh, deploy their, uh, their learning strategies. Excellent, and Marty, have you made it back to make an appearance yet? I'm here if you guys can see me. Excellent, I'm yes. So thank you, I'm uh, Dr. Marty Leathers. I am the Director of Workforce Development for the State of Missouri. Really glad to be here and to be a part of the conversation today. Excellent, thank you. Well, Deb, let's go ahead and have you kick it off. Sure. Well, thank you, Megan, for getting us all introduced. And we're excited to discuss our findings on the current state of the skills gap and its impact on corporations' critical business goals. But before we start, uh, just to provide you a little context in case you aren't familiar with Wiley, we are a 200-year-old family-owned company who has remained dedicated to supporting education and research, bringing to bear our expertise and working collaboratively with our employer and education partners as a bridge to create better workforce outcomes to unlock human potential through the power of education. So what I'm excited to present on today is the methodology of our most recent uh, research study. And this is the third of uh, our three projects. Uh, but before I begin, one of the things that I wanna make sure that we do is that we, we make sure that we're using the same definition to the term skills gap. Uh, the findings that David and I will be presenting today are based on the definition that the skills gap is skills employers seek that do not match with the skills that current job seekers possess. So with that definition in mind, let's uh, get started. So is there evidence that a skills gap exists and that that gap continues to widen? 
For this research project and the survey sample, like we did in 2018 and 2019, we surveyed 600 US full-time HR and learning development leaders who have decision-making authority to determine if the skills gap uh, is meaningful to them. The breakdown of response rates included a 15% engagement from C-level or executive level. The larger majority of respondents, about 60%, were senior, managerial, or supervisory levels, and the remaining 26% remaining are employees with no supervisory responsibilities. And for this past research, it was really important for us to gain a deeper understanding of how the different constituents within the corporate structure are perceiving and responding to the skills gap, their understanding of the role of education, how education benefits mitigate the skills gap, and at what level, if any, uh, companies are incorporating education and training as part of their strategic plan. So let's talk about who we engaged. Company respondents were from a diverse range of industry sectors. And in fact, we broke them down into 12 categories and they ranged from technology, education, financial services and insurance, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, and of these industry sectors, uh, the technology sector provided the most response rate and they comprised about 25% with the other industries uh, hovering somewhere between two and 10%. The, those sectors with the lowest response rate were hospitality, telecommunications and nonprofit. Uh, also, we should note the company size. So 59% uh, of the company respondents came from companies employing fewer than a thousand up to 10,000 employees, 28% were from companies with 10,000 to 50,000 employees, and 12% of respondents came from companies with more than 50,000 employees. So David's going to go into more detail in just a minute, but we can tell you with great confidence what hasn't changed over the past three research projects. That is that the, there is the belief that the skills gap is real, and the companies believe this gap is impacting their hiring process and their talent mobility within the organization. And what I can also tell you with confidence is that companies are shifting and somewhat significantly the types of education used for hiring and training to upskill, reskill, and right skill their incumbent workforce. And this is why we're really excited to have this conversation today and bring experts like Marty and Mark into the discussion. Uh, but before we engage Marty and Mark, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague David to discuss a few of our key findings from the recent research. Yeah, thanks for that, Deb. Um, so we, uh, like Deb said, you know, like part of what we were doing is trying to get into these organizations and understand a little bit about what their needs are and how they're addressing those needs. And so one of the first questions we asked are, what are the skills that are most in demand? And, and obviously this is aggregated data. So for a given profession or something, you're going to have different skills, but at, but at a broad scale, these are sort of the most in-demand skills. And what we tried to do is um, group them by hard skill and soft skill. And part of the reason we did that was, um, you know, what we're finding more and more is these hard skills have a really short kind of half-life to them, whereas the soft skills can carry you through your entire career. So understanding refresh rates and the need for upskilling and things like that is part of the reason why we, we separate these two groups out. Um, you probably find some unsurprising things here, you know, that, that uh, data skills, computer technology skills, skills like that are going to be really high in demand. So are critical thinking, communication, and creativity on, on the soft skill side. It was interesting for us to slice through some of this data and find um, different uh, kind of levels uh, within the organization. Like Deb mentioned, uh, we, we asked a lot of C-suite folks what they thought the most in demand skill or what the hardest skill was uh, for them to fill. And it was creativity. So there's some some variance between you know where you are in the org and what you uh, you know are looking to to pick up, but generally speaking, these are sort of the more in demand type skills. Megan, if we can go to the next slide, um, getting a little bit a layer deeper into the data, one of the things that we wanted to understand was um, how are attitudes changing over time around uh, different ways of evaluating those skills, right? So how do you as an employer evaluate whether a potential um, employee has that communication skill, that creativity skill, or maybe that, you know, kind of hard technical skill that you're looking for. And um, unsurprisingly, we find that the degree is still king, right? It's not unseated. We're still largely looking at 
uh, you know, uh, the degree being sort of the coin of the realm to be able to, uh, you know, demonstrate that you've got these skills. But what's interesting to us is just the, um, the real acceleration towards more acceptance of, um, you know, industry certifications and digital badges and some of these other kind of uh, micro credentials, you know, that, that, that we offer that are, that are below the degree and sometimes even below the credit hour. Um, we also think that, or we also found that when we looked at how effective the different learning techniques were, um, similarly, uh, the, uh, the companies are saying, hey, you know, like go to the university, we'll do, we'll give you tuition reimbursement, we'll give you maybe a discount at a university, that's a good place for you to go and do your learning. Um, but as you go down that list, they're almost equally as interested in boot camps and alternative types of, uh, of ways of learning these apprenticeships, things along those lines on the job training, um, you know, increasingly getting more interest. And I think that's something that, that Marty will likely talk a lot about um, too. So if we go to the next slide here, Megan, uh, the last thing that we wanted to, to share with you today, and this is a big report and there's a lot of different data points within it, but, um, you know, we started off talking a little bit about uh, what kind of skills are in demand and then where they're getting those skills. But the last section here uh, is where we were really focused is where are the opportunities to connect and, and kind of, you know, be a multiplier in here. And so one of the things that we wanted to point out was only about a third of uh, the places that we surveyed were actively working with the university uh, to try to get these skills. So there's an acknowledgement of, yeah, we've got a tuition reimbursement program. Maybe we bring in some out tra outside training here or there, but we're really not partnering as much as we probably could directly with a local learning institution to get the skills that we need to get to establish that pipeline. Um, and then second to that, the other side of the page, something that was really interesting to us was just the low rates of, of usage on some of these benefits, right? So you've essentially got free money sitting there, you know, oftentimes five, $6,000 a year for you to go and do some learning. And um, very few companies uh, had more than 10% of their staff taking advantage of that, right? So really sort of low levels. So um, for us, what we see is just a lot of opportunity on this page um, to really boost those levels. Like let's, let's use some of that, those dollars um, and let's get more partnerships established where we can uh, really, really find those connection points and get some of these skills to these folks. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information and insights. And as you can see in the chat, there's a link to the full report there. And I really enjoyed looking at it. I thought it was just enough deep data and insights without being too overwhelming. So you could really uh, grab on to some key points and takeaways. So question to you, Mark, how well do we in higher education actually understand the skills that employers are seeking? And how do we get better signals from employers and the labor market? Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's a great question. I thought this report was also very interesting. I think the skills gap has um, only, only gotten greater. And so being able to work with uh, employers to understand what those skills are, how are they defined? What are the jobs associated to those skills? Um, really help as a university uh, align our curriculum to the changes in the marketplace. Um, so it, it's, it's a challenge. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's, there's, it's a difficult thing to do. And let me explain a little bit about why I think it's hard to do. But sometimes it's difficult to get a single employer to say, okay, here are the skills that I need. Let me line them up for you. Um, and then you look at industry and it becomes even more difficult because industry has to agree on the skills that they need and definitions. Um, so one thing that we've done at George Mason that has proven really, really useful um, is working more directly with employers through uh, industry associations, aggregations of employers. One of those is the Greater Washington Partnership. And they've been fantastic at doing something that very few companies, industries, uh, and others around the Greater Washington area do. They've sat down to provide a list of knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSAs. That's how federal government, but a lot of employers hire people. With that knowledge, we've been able to then align a lot of our curriculum in critical areas, um, specifically in technical areas, but I'll get back to that later because um, it's certainly the soft skills or what we call essential skills are important too. But to be able to understand and get that picture holistically from one employer, much less many employers on what the signal is, what is the, the critical knowledge, skills and abilities helps us to make what we do more transparent to the learner 
and ultimately more transparent to the employer. Uh, and that skills transparency exercise that we're, we're underway with, I think is really valuable as an example of working really closely with employers, listening to what they have to say and making sure that there's some alignment between the needs in the labor market and what we do as a university. It, it helps, it benefits everyone from faculty to student to employer. Excellent, thank you, Mark. And Marty, you bring in a very critical perspective of the workforce uh, at a state agency. So what do you see as the key role of a state agency like the Missouri State Workforce Development Board in bridging the skills gap between education and employers and workforce? Thanks, Megan. Yeah, for us, um, you know, this report was, it was extremely intriguing and, and I love seeing some of the data and seeing how the data uh, is, is, is updated because this data has to be refreshed on a pretty routine basis. I think that's what, you know, um, kudos to this team for pulling that report together because even 12 months ago, if we were looking at data, it's outdated. And so this is data that we really need to have some, because, you know, the social contract with work is changing. And, and yes, the pandemic has accelerated what was already happening before the pandemic, but state agencies like ours, you know, we, we work at the nexus of education uh, and employment, right? Our whole job is to connect those two things together and to really focus on how do we help our citizens access sustainable employment? And, you know, which leads to things like family sustaining wages and a life of dignity uh, and economic prosperity. So certainly education and training have to be part of that equation, as does understanding the needs and aligning the needs of our employers to the skill sets that are either uh, that our current workforce has or what they aspire to have. Now, the challenge we, is really interesting right now is as that social contract with work is being rethought by so many uh, workers, whether you're an incumbent worker or you've been unemployed, um, you know, this, this new focus is, is, is thinking about, I was okay in this job maybe for a decade, but now I'm no longer comfortable in this job. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I was content with my associate's degree being, you know, in, in, in a supervisory role, but now I really understand I need to move forward because that's not sustainable. And the pandemic taught me a lot. Or, mm -hmm. you know what, life's too short, so I'm going to retire um, because maybe I stuck around a little longer than, than before. So now it creates this gap where all of our middle managers are moving up and we have an entry level gap. Skills have to deal with all of that, right? So what skills do we need on the top end and the bottom end, middle end to make sure that we can help that, that natural um, cycle occur in our workforce system? And so that's what we're thinking about all the time. And it's that alignment. I love the talk about micro credentials. I love the talk about industry recognized credentials, which is you know, a federal term that we use to say that these are things that uh, the federal government says we can use our money on, but also that employers have, have, have agreed to take. You know, we spend a lot of energy in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, all registered programs. Um, and we spend a lot of time on, you know, associate's degrees and baccalaureate degrees and, and, and post-grad degrees, helping Missourians get on a path and understanding it's also not linear. It's not, I graduate high school at 18 and then I go to maybe a two year and then a four year and then I get my master's degree, but maybe I'm 24, I'm 29 or I'm 36 and now I'm coming back into school. Uh, because I want to finish out my degree or I want to move to another career. And so those are the things that we're thinking about that we have to navigate really from age 16 up to age 65, helping individuals navigate um, the workforce through accessing more skills. And, and you know, I saw a question here about uh, LinkedIn uh, and LinkedIn learning and, and I, you know, and, and Dr. Bolzer gave a, a good response, you know, Employers that we talk to, they want to see that stuff. That helps you stand out, but that's not going to make you hireable. And the, and the one thing we have to think about when we think about education and training and certifications, there's the what makes you hireable and there's the what helps you be promoted and recruited and moved up. And, you know, the job market is very much about relationships still. And, and the, the higher you get um, in, the, uh, in the skills game, the more likely you are to be recruited for a position than to be able to apply coldly, Right. So that's when those things really come into play, when you're wanting to move up in an organization or make a move to another organization as a promotion because you've either been recruited or you have a relationship there that you can leverage. Excellent, thank you. David, on one of the slides, maybe Kim can take us back a couple slides to the point about um, what employers value when they're looking at uh, they're doing a hire. So David, talk about how Employers are requesting more responsive and agile programs, 
including certifications and micro credentials, but they still highly favor traditional degrees. And I'm wondering if any of your analysis uncovered some of those anecdotes about that disconnect. Yeah, it was it, it was interesting to see for us because we um, because we had this data, we were able to like run some pivots on it, and you really saw this difference between how sort of the the C suite and the executive leadership thought about some of this stuff, and then how maybe more frontline folks did. And and with with both groups, there was an acknowledgement of um, you know a skills gap, but obviously the um, sort of high level folks saw much more much more of a problem with it, right? They're they're much more of a challenge and. It was interesting for me to see that like their number one strategy was, well, we'll just hire folks in, right? So, so if we've got a if we've got a problem in our organization, we just hire new talent in rather than build, right? Like their first thought is hire in new. Um, and so the question for me is always like, well, you've already got staff, you've already got people that know your systems, you've already got people that um, you know have loyalty and and are physically close to you or whatever, you know, a number of different things that and and why not grow them, right? Not why not build them is something that I think wasn't necessarily always their first priority. Um, and I really think these sorts of smaller educational opportunities can be the thing that gets you almost like a finishing school, right? Like you've already got your bachelor's degree, maybe you even have your master's degree, but but the the market sort of has drifted over the time. Like Marty said, maybe that credential is not fresh anymore. Uh, maybe it's a technology that has a really short half-life. How do we sort of get folks to move along and progress in their career, I think is... Um, uh, a big part of where I, th I see like the opportunity here. Excellent, thanks. And Deb, as the primary author of the Reimagining the Workforce report, what's the most significant point higher education leaders should take away? What can they be responsive about now to help bridge learners, skills, and employment? Well, I think David just um, mentioned that and Dr. Leathers, uh, you know, specifically identified <clears throat> it as uh, lifelong learning. So knowing that the, uh, the skills that you have because technology is continually advancing and changing and because we have uh, companies who are continually pivoting and bringing in uh, either new technologies or new processes uh, to uh, maximize uh, their efforts, uh, we have to continue to educate and uh, advanced learning within and outside of uh, that corporation and within and outside of our academic partners. So I think there needs to be uh, a much better dialogue between um, what employers say they need and then um, list on job descriptions and truly what can be delivered in just-in-time learning. Are there ways that we can bring back uh, alumni from our institutions and uh, help them advance and gain the right kind of skills that they need to move up within the organization? Um, and most specifically, how do we identify uh, those individuals in our communities who are um, uh, kind of stunted because of their lack of skills and be able to engage them, put them on a path uh, that, in, that allows them as uh, either a working adult or an unemployed uh, adult to find the right kind of program delivered in the right way with the right supporting um, services to ensure that they can complete um, and uh, attain those skills and quickly get back into the workforce. Uh, one of the things that I found most interesting during the pandemic and talking to several um, of our uh, academic partners uh, is that they had individuals who were coming back who were highly qualified, but maybe lost their job due the, to the pandemic and were coming back and getting um, a type of certification that would allow them to quickly uh, get back into the market. That may be that they're going back from uh, having a, a bachelor's degree and securing a certification from one of the local community colleges, or it may be uh, someone who has a baccalaureate degree who's, uh, or a master's degree who's coming back in for a master's certification that helps them pivot into a new and open role. So I think one of it is really understanding the needs of your uh, your, your immediate uh, community, uh, your regional community, and you know, across a state, what are the skills that employers are seeking and how can you help uh, individuals engage in a more timely manner uh, to gain those skills? Excellent, and Mark, this next question leads from Deb's point, but often graduates have great skills and they're in demand, but they just don't know how to articulate how those skills translate and apply. 
how can we in higher education help learners identify and highlight those skills? Yeah, I think it's so important. Um, just to, before I answer that question, I do want to come back to the, uh, uh, a comment that I've seen across some of the chat in general. Is it degrees or is it micro credentials? The answer is both. Um, you, you need both. They're both indicators of performance and skill and ability um, that employers use as signals. And we are in a world of lifelong learning. And so a university uh, or higher ed institution, community college should never just be seen as a place you come to once, spend a couple of years and go off. You really should come back and continually retool, upskill, retrain, uh, and, and use the, the resources that universities and community colleges can provide to help you continue uh, your career. Career isn't usually done after just one degree. Um, so to your question around how to make skills specifically more visible. Um, this is a really important part of our discussion. First off, skills are difficult to define. People don't always agree on the definition of the skill. And I think what's really challenging for an undergrad in particular, so I'll come back to maybe the degree holder, but for the undergrad, what do you do? You go through your college experience and you take some courses and you get a grade and maybe you get some credits. And when you're done, you get a transcript and a degree. Um, and how do you use that transcript to get a job? Well, not all employers ask you for a transcript, some do, but you'd look back at your transcript and say, gee, I don't really remember what that course was all about, or gosh, what did that course contain that was valuable for me to explain to an employer? So one of the areas that a lot of us are working on in higher education, not just Mason, is to map uh, skills and align those skills to courses. Because we know that the faculty are busy building great courses that are designed to train uh, and develop people for future, for their futures and for the future of the country, but they don't necessarily explain specifically what skills you just acquired as a result of taking my course. So at Mason, we're not only mapping skills, but we're also building a concept called the skills transcript that is designed to highlight to a student, uh, not only you know, the grade and credits and other things, but the skills that they acquired um, in their major. This turns out to be a really helpful tool for helping students decide on which major they want because it relates to a certain set of skills that relate to a certain job. Um, but it ultimately provides them with a tool, no matter where they are in their educational process, uh, that allows them to articulate, what did I get in this course? What's the hard return on my investment in form of skills? And the most important thing, to prepare them for the interview. Uh, because when they walk into the interview, maybe they've got a resume that says, here's a skill, project management. What, what, did, what did that project management skill mean? How did I learn that skill? And so they're at a disadvantage when they walk into an interview and they say, uh, yeah, I took a course and it involved project management. That's it. And, they're in, and that's the end. They don't really demonstrate that they understand what it took to build the skills and competencies associated to project management so that they can get that job. So we really believe that the process of skills mapping and creating that roadmap that leads to a transcript is an important way to make skills more transparent to both the student and to the employer. And interestingly, I think it's very helpful for faculty um, to see uh, what skills uh, are contained within their courses. It doesn't change their course necessarily, but it certainly helps them lift out the, the, the skills that they're already providing. So that's, that's part of that skills transparency uh, uh, model that we're trying to build. Yeah, excellent. And I'd love to learn more about that. So I'll, I'll be following up. <laughs> Marty, this is a question for you. There, there's growing momentum and there's some really effective apprenticeships in, uh, in process right now. How can higher education identify partners and some pointers on effective implementation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of energy around apprenticeships. I'm certainly extremely passionate about apprenticeship programs. And I know we think of you know, apprenticeship programs is maybe kind of the, you know, the older model where it was really just our skilled trades. And it was about articulation agreements between our, you know, uh, labor management organizations and 
predominantly community colleges, but also some universities to you know, articulate back um, uh, you know, uh, complete apprentices to, to receive um, some uh, certifications or even degrees. But the models really changed quite a bit in the last uh, six years. Missouri has been really aggressive and very successful in modernizing and expanding apprenticeships. We're very intentional about saying modernizing and expanding because while we still follow a registered apprenticeship model, meaning an apprenticeship is an apprenticeship and not um, you know, uh, anything else, you know, it has to hit those, those requirements for instance, if you're an apprentice, you're employed day one, bottom line. So you can't be an apprentice if you're not employed. That's really important because a lot of uh, the job seekers that, uh, that we work with, you know, are coming to us. And they, they, they need to, you know, earn and learn model. They can't, they, they aren't in a position where they can just go to school. So apprenticeship affords that and, and offers that opportunity to be working, but also learning. Those programs have to be at least 12 months long or, or 2,080 hours of on the job learning and 144 hours of what's called related training and instruction. Guess who has to deliver that related training and instruction, which is a requirement of an apprenticeship? It has to be our colleges or universities. Yes, it can be third-party providers, but I can tell you in Missouri, we lean heavily on our community colleges and our universities to do that. Now, I come from community college background, um, and I helped design, um, come, it's probably going to be an arrogant statement, I don't mean it to be that way, but I helped design the first community college system um, apprenticeship certification program in the, in the country about six years ago, Missouri Community College Association put that together. And we did that because we wanted to have common framework and common curriculum across our 13 community colleges that would serve um, advanced manufacturing, construction, um, you know, IT, healthcare, et cetera, and develop these, um, rec you know, uh, recognized apprenticeship programs that, that, you know, you could take across the state. That model was important because it put education at the center. So education had to sit down and I, and I love the chat. And we're having great talks about how do you engage employers and you know, employers need to tell us what they need. And we all know they can't do that very well. They don't understand it. You know, it, it really flips the model from when you're not just a training provider or an educator, but now you're a consultant, right? You're a solutions architect. You have to sit down with that employer and help them do the skills inventory, help them determine what their needs are. And then you can design an apprenticeship program, which by the way, we have 60,000 standards out there nationwide. You just pull out of a database and you make some tweaks, right? And the curriculum is already built for you. So education has to play that role, but where education has to get out of its, out of its current comfort zone is understanding that you have to be consultants. You're gonna to have to go out to the employer and sit down side by side with the employer and help them understand what their needs are because they can't articulate that. They just know they're not getting what they think they need, but they don't know how to say what they need. Apprenticeships, are one way, not a silver bullet, but one way in which that creates that partnership. And now we've expanded into pre-apprenticeship programs, which again, it's not a pre-apprenticeship if it's not directly connected to a fully registered apprenticeship program to say, there's a lot of people who aren't qualifying. You know, we talk to employers and say, you know what, we can't hire them because they're not ready yet, or they're not gonna be successful in this registered apprenticeship because they're not ready yet. So now we're able to do kind of that outer layer, right? You know, those, those, uh, those vectors, if you will, to help, uh, you know, citizens who don't qualify for apprenticeship now or can't be successful in apprenticeship, but instead of just casting them off uh, and sending them somewhere else, now we're saying, listen, let's get you into a pre-apprenticeship program, which will help you prepare and help you be more successful. And guess who's at the forefront of that? It has to be education. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, those partnerships and education being able to figure out and understand what business needs and helping business understand what business needs is incredibly important. Apprenticeships are a great model to do that, but you have to think of yourselves as consultants, uh, solutions architects, whatever buzzword you want to use, but it's about sitting down and working with them to understand because um, pulling out the course catalog and the course schedule and saying, here's what we offer and here's what is in the degree. And sorry, if you can't, you know, you got to wait eight weeks to start or sorry, if you know, that class is only offered once a semester every decade, you know, that, that's not going to work. It, it really is that customized solution of sitting down and working with them. And, you know, that can lead to a degree path, which can be more formalized, but it's, it's the entry and the access and the starting point that makes the difference. I wanted to yeah. piggyback on this a little bit. Um, you know, it's interesting in our data, we found that something like one out of six employers allowed um, uh, tuition as a benefit, tuition reimbursement, that sort of thing, right when you got started, right? Usually they want you to wait six months or a year or something and really kind of prove yourself before you start learning and, and you know it's really interesting to think about marty like you were saying this like learn you know learn and earn kind of model i think a lot of the time when we think of an apprenticeship we're thinking about a you know really highly skilled kind of role right you know something 
um, you know, maybe a trade or, or, or something along those lines. But I think there's also an opportunity for um, this to really help the unskilled market too, right? So there's, a, you know, we've seen some of the early examples of this with, uh, you know, um, Amazon and Starbucks doing different models out there where they're frontline employees. As soon as you get in, if you can work 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week, we'll give you, you know, that five, $6,000 a year towards your bachelor completer or whatever it ends up being. And I think there's a lot of um, creative models out there that are possible uh, under this larger umbrella of learn and earn. I love that phrase. Excellent. Well, I had a few more questions, but the volume of questions in the Q and A is quickly snowballing. <laughs> and we did we did inventory people when they registered to see if they had questions. So I'd like to propose that we try and get through the questions that are in the Q and A, and then we can follow up on those separately. But there's there's a lot that we want to get into, and I I too wanted to address this question that has gotten the most upvotes. In this conversation, we, we didn't have a lot of time to dive into you know, the whole student and the whole learner, but there, the question from Bernard is, is there an implicit notion in this discussion that maybe degrees don't matter? Is it more certificate selected competencies, et cetera? And then and the other flip side of that is, why so much focus on these credentials? You know, are we just trying to teach learners to learn? I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, let me let me take that for for starters. Um, it depends on the study that you look at, and you're looking at a skills study, but there's also earning studies. Um, those who receive degrees uh, versus those who receive just a diploma. There's not a lot of data on micro credentials yet. Uh, will earn on average, and that's a big average, about a million dollars more in their lifetime. Uh, that's historical, uh, historically true, and um, I imagine that that will change the gap between the diploma holder slash micro-credential holder um, could ultimately change. It's hard to say. Um, one of the other interesting pieces of, of um, uh, data that we've looked at um, pretty hard is that many, if not most of the micro formal micro-credential holders, and boy, there's a lot of micro-credentials out there, um, uh, are generally degree holders. Um, so that, that you know, I'm sure that will also change. Um, but what that sort of evokes is it's an and. Uh, uh, it's not an either or question. That, that degrees are critically important, I think, for, for many. Uh, that micro-credentials are, in many respects, in my mind, the way we've thought about it is smaller units of learning that are more digestible over time um, that either ramp you in to a degree um, sort of the on-ramp into a degree, or importantly, an off-ramp. Um, if you haven't been able to complete a degree, a micro-credential can be awfully handy um, as something of value for the time that you spent in a higher education institution or elsewhere. And then there's the lifelong learner who already has a degree or maybe didn't complete that needs to advance. And a smaller unit of, of learning that is more targeted around skills that are in demand, literally backed by an employer, is highly valuable. Um, it's not just the university and the brand that's associated to micro-credential that shows you quality, um, but also a willingness of an employer to say, yes, I would like to hire that person who has that micro-credential uh, that fills a skill gap that's critical to us. Um, that's, a, that's super valuable for the worker, that's super valuable for the employer, and I think ultimately improves sort of national productivity. So mm -hmm. I think it's a both, it's not an either or. Mark, we um, we do a lot of surveying directly of, of students too. Like this one obviously was more focused on employers and sort of the HR back office, you know, kind of stuff. But when we ask students, you know, um, how do you want to engage with your university moving forward? A, a really large amount of them tell them, I want to go back. You know, I'm, I'm really excited to go back and get an, and I think there's a lot of the time, there's just no product there for them to engage in, right? It's, yeah. they don't want to come back for two years and $40,000. They want to come back for, a couple of months and a couple thousand dollars, right? Something that's going to be within their tuition reimbursement, that sort of thing. And so I think having those things available for them, just from the purely there's demand for it side is important to remember too, outside of the fact of whether or not employers find these things useful. The students want to do it. People want to do it. People want to want to learn. Right. It becomes this binary decision, either a big investment of time and money or nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be that. It, it, it ultimately should be 
Um, I, I can spend a certain amount of time and you know what, I'm technical, but I don't know if I'm technical enough to make it to a, a master's degree in cybersecurity engineering. Mm -hmm. So maybe if I took a micro credential to test out my abilities and skills in cyber that could eventually lead to a master's degree, it's a great way to test whether or not it's a good use of my time and energy. So I, I agree, it's a, that is missing. And I, we hear the same thing from students, more relevance, more direct applicability, more experience, um, and something that paths me towards a degree that may take me a while to earn, but gives me an immediate return, not just a, a deferred return. Yeah, there's also the earned admissions part of this too, with where you know, not really today's conversation, but but some of these MOOC to credit pathways, some of these like certificate to credit pathways, I think it really opens up for folks that maybe took a meandering path in their undergrad and maybe don't have the best GPA, you know, but they, they've got a lot of work experience and they, you know, they're really ready to get to the next level. And or I've been in the military, I should be able to convert that experience to something that's, mm -hmm. that's relevant to what you do completely. And I would say from the employer's standpoint, you know, one of the things that we were talking about or a question that was asked are uh, what's the relevancy of um, a four-year degree, uh, where's the pushback? We do have just in our engagement with uh, corporations, many corporations who are looking at um, what skill sets can be uh, hired against that don't require a four-year degree. And can I more quickly bring in a qualified uh, worker and then put them on a path using um, you know, tuition assistance to help you know, create those career pathways within. So I think you've seen with, um, I think David, you brought it up, uh, you know, Amazon being one that's hiring, you don't need a college degree, let's get you in the door and then let's uh, figure out a way to put you on a pathway for talent mobility within the organization. So I think that is something um, that we need to be really cognizant about from the perspective of the higher education space. How do we best support uh, and, uh, deliver the right time type of programs in, in the way that's meaningful for uh, employees. Um, so that's one thing that I think is uh, really important. And I think we also have to take into consideration there are kind of two different philosophies for how corporations use tuition assistance. One is, um, at David, as you said, bringing in uh, that uh, frontline employee and uh, keeping them, retaining them for a longer period of time because you can use benefits so that they can secure uh, a, a meaningful degree for them. So that's one philanthropic way of doing it. The other one is the business imperative standpoint of corporations understanding who do we need to attract with what type of skills, what are the right kind of additional training and degree programs do we need to make sure that we can fill um, you know, positions within our own organization. The problem that we're seeing is that many co corporations, even though they offer these uh, tuition assistance, haven't curated the programs appropriately and they haven't marketed them appropriately uh, within the organization. So you have a very uh, low um, engagement rate from employees where I do think uh, that that's where we're, we're not seeing these being as effective as they could be. And then the last point um, that I would say is, uh, uh, I can't remember, Mark, it may have been you that uh, mentioned this, uh, having that ability to transcript education or training and, um, and using that as currency toward a degree, uh, the more interoperable that we can make those, uh, that, that currency of transfer, the better off we are gonna be as an education community. Great, and there was a question in the chat and some conversation around using the Open Skills Network and the framework of ACRO. So mm -hmm. I don't know, Mark, if you're using those frameworks to map skills. Um, we're connected to the Open Skills Network. Um, we haven't gotten quite as um, attached to the framework yet, but that's certainly something that we, we plan to do as the framework evolves. Um, it takes, it takes a lot to build these frameworks, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna just drop the link into chat so that we have it there for people. And then, you know, there's a few of these questions that I think could be webcast on their own, including do higher degrees really guarantee a greater career? So we're gonna just table that for another discussion, but that is a great question. And I think we all have passionate feelings about it. I do wanna jump into, um, how, and David, I think this, you touched on this a little bit, but how do hard communication skills different 
that differ from hard soft skills. Sorry, so around communication skills around communication, and, yes. and, and sort of how they're, um, how they're different or uh, so, yeah, I, I think someone might be referencing, there was an early, earlier slide there that said communication is like a hard communication skill. Essentially that's writing, right? For, for a lot of it is, is sort of the, um, demonstrable sort of communication skills that you might have that you can sort of like prove in a really easy way. Um, communication is interesting though, because it pops up a lot on the other side, on sort of the soft skill side in a lot of the different things around like collaboration and management and teamwork and leadership and all these other things I think essentially at their core are communication skills. Um, so like a hard communication skill is writing a press release, but a soft communication skill is like running a good meeting, things along those lines. That's probably where those breakdowns would be as I see them. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, I didn't communicate that better. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. <laughs> uh, here's a question from Thomas Darcy and he has, he has lots of experience with this too. So I'd be curious if he has any comments in the chat, but what observations were made in terms of changing skills priorities associated with digital lit literacy, digital transformation and the needs of industry? I don't know if it, it's, it's a mark. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that one. Just it, it's sort of the, the end of the story about the Greater Washington Partnership because in our region, digital skills are critical. And there are two types of digital skills that we're building that alignment between KSAs and curriculum and then micro-credentialing. Um, and it was one of the things I didn't mention. We're through the GWP, we're building a micro-credential in uh, digital technologies. And it's designed specifically for the liberal arts student, because right now we have so many engineers in our region that there's a limited pie. So how do we expand the pie of talent in our region? Um, one way to do that is to upskill uh, those in the liberal arts, uh, those that have great communication skills, that have great team building skills, leadership skills, all the things that you, you normally associate with the liberal arts and get them to talk digital. Um, and so uh, through that program, we created a, a, a micro-credential for the digital technology generalist. Um, this is someone who's a liberal arts student who gets information security training, uh, who gets statistical analysis, data visualization, and can now speak um, in digital terms. They're not deep coders. They're not gonna be folks who you wanna hire for your engineering team, but they're pretty much everyone you wanna hire in the rest of your business because uh, they've got great communication skills or essential skills, along with um, some of the technical vocabulary and knowledge that they need to be effective in today's modern business world. So that's a, a, I think digital transformation is, is the buzzword around Washington, D.C. Every organization, federal and private, is going through some form of transformation and needs those digital skills. Yeah, to, to follow on, Mark, and to even underscore that, you know, Missouri right now, we have about 226,000 job postings. I get that number every day. That's one of the things I think about. You know, and, and that, so I look at that, I look at how many Missourians are receiving an unemployment claim, which is about 412,000. And then I look at the, you know, what is in the job postings? 79% of all of our job postings have the term Microsoft in them, whether it's Microsoft Office, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word. <laughs> we have a significant skills mismatch when it comes to that. You know, we think of a lot of people who are unemployed right now, who maybe were in positions that before the pandemic didn't require those digital skill sets that now to go back to work need to have those digital skill sets. So we're focused very heavily on digital literacy here. And it's, it's a national problem. It's a Missouri problem. It's a DC problem. It's everywhere problem. Like Mark says, we have to find a way to, to address that because um, you know, even if you've been, I mean, even I'm a younger person at 38 and you know, just because I took Microsoft access you know, in my undergrad, which I, you know, completed in, in the mid 2000s, you know, 2005, if I got a job tomorrow with Microsoft Access, it doesn't mean I still know how to use Microsoft Access because the, the technology has advanced so much. Plus, I just don't remember what the heck I, I did um, when I slept through that class. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you've done, even if you've been in work for a while, if it's been one or two years since you've used Microsoft Excel, you're behind. And so we constantly have to um, hone up our digital literacy. Um, as well as bring those who don't have any literacy whatsoever as it relates to digital skill sets back to the middle. You know, the other point I want to make here is, is we focus a lot on, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, entry-level skills and, and high, you know, those high-level skills, but the middle skills are really important. And they're, by the way, it's very hard to define what middle skills are. 
um, you know, we, we kind of look at middle skills are, okay, you have a high school diploma or a high set, but you have not yet completed a two-year degree or higher. Somewhere in there, you know, you probably have some um, experience. You probably maybe have some competency, um, uh, you know, training and education. Maybe you have some credentials, I'm sure, industry-recognized credentials. But what is it that you, you know, have done recently to, to hone up? Can you use touch screens on everything? Because everything's a touch screen now. You know, and, and if you're still using the older phones, you don't know how to use touchscreen, then it's going to be hard for you to work anywhere because everything now is touchscreen. You know, and, and so just understanding the role of technology and investing in our existing workforce to increase digital literacy among our existing workers is as important as those who are out of work um, to create that resiliency in our market. And I've avoided the pandemic um, shine a spotlight on that. We knew it, but the pandemic now has just told us, yikes, we have a productivity problem because we can't get enough um, digital literacy programs up and running and, and, and done fast stuff. It's interesting, Marty, there's, there's a component of our business that, that, you know, is almost acts as a finishing school for folks that come from these engineering programs and stuff, but we're trying to translate them into working for, you know, a large bank or a large insurance company or something along those lines. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of what we have to do is train them on the existing system. And that existing system isn't the cutting edge one all the time, right? So it's like, you go into your undergrad and you're really excited about, internet of things and artificial intelligence and drones and all this other stuff. But then you get into the real world and it's like, I needed to learn about, you know, customer relationship management platforms and enterprise resource planning. And maybe it's not the the stuff that's really sexy, but it's, that's where the job is. And so, so oftentimes too, there's that sort of um, need to get people, even the people that are really smart and really sophisticated to get oriented back down to the things that are, that are going to be, um, you know, they're kind of meat and potatoes type skills. Excellent. Well, I'm going to jump in here. We have 27 more questions to get through. No, <laughs> joking. But there's a there's a few that have risen to the top with upvotes and I just wanna make sure that we can get through those in the next three or so minutes. So Jessica Adams asked, what are the next steps for this report? I'm curious to see how workforce development in high schools slash colleges will continue to evolve their partnership. Yeah, so um, Deb, I'll, I'll lead this, but if you've got anything, feel free to jump in. But, uh, you know, for us, what, what we're really excited about is the opportunity to, um, as a researcher, to ask the same question over and over again, which I know isn't always the most um, exciting thing, but I think it's really great to start looking at this on more of a longitudinal basis. And so, uh, you know, full disclosure, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, but we really retooled the instrument this year. And so I think in our, our next couple of years, it's going to be asking these same questions again and again to track if there's changes over time. So that's what I get really excited about, but I think every year there's an opportunity for us to flex and think about, um, you know, what are big trends right now? Like, so you could imagine questions about, um, you know, in a post COVID world, what's going on, or if there's a new technology, that sort of thing. Um, we'll definitely want to incorporate that. But I think, um, yeah, what I'm most excited about is to start seeing year over year data. Yeah. And I would say too, David, the only thing I would add to that is we're also going to supplement that with some uh, industry vertical Mm -hmm. um, deeper dive. So we're going to be looking at a specific sector across a state um, through an association to really understand what the needs are, um, how those are being articulated by the executives, how they are being understood by the employees, what are the fears, the barriers, um, the mitigating factors that are preventing, uh, you know, employees to uh, go back and secure additional education. So I think that's going to be a really different um, kind of lens from which we can do some research and then try to pair those back and draw some correlations. Great, and Deb, while I have you, I know these insights were from 600 HR professionals in the US, but do you know how these skills compare globally? You know, that would probably be a, a, a question for David more than for me. I haven't looked at it from a global perspective to see how these align. Uh, I don't know, David, if you have. Yeah, um, we have a little bit. And so we, uh, we as a company have a global mindset. Um, you know, we're kind of concentrated in certain areas uh, like the UK and Europe and, and Australia and the Middle East. And it's interesting to see um, some of the other economies are a little more, lean a little more to the technical than we do in, in, in some of these areas. And so um, sort of, you know, it's, it's all turning dials and knobs, right? Like we might do a little bit more manufacturing, we might have a lot more entry level type jobs, things like that. Whereas maybe there's other economies that that are maybe a little bit more professionalized or, or you know, have a little bit more te um, technology. So there are some differences. I think that the skills don't change as much as the, 
the ratios of them, if that makes sense. I think that's true across the states too, right? Like, I think a lot of the time we think about, um, wow, you really need these like programming skills in Silicon Valley and, and, you know, maybe in New York, but the reality is, is that there's programming roles, there's data analysis roles all over the country. You know, we, we need a lot of these skills uh, kind of everywhere. Excellent. Well, I don't think we're going to have time for many more or any more questions. There are so many good comments and questions, though. I'm going to take some time sorting through this and then we'll get back to you if we can. And I just wanted to say, Marty said, you know, it's time for higher education to sort of flex and be uncomfortable. And I know we just went through a year of that. We were all in <laughs> in incredible un un comfort, discomfort. And the cool thing is, is that we realized how flexible and adaptable we are. So kudos to you all. And I think this is our real opportunity to start doing some foundational work if it hasn't already begun and then really starting to move the needle on these partnerships. So um, with that, I'd like to just thank our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you for participating. We had excellent, excellent questions, comments. Um, I will clean up the chat and share that back out because I think there was a lot of resources that were shared in there. I don't know if you all were able to keep better handle on things than I was, but there was a lot, a lot of things flying by. So you can see the contact information and the Twitter handles for our participants there. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Kim who kicked us off today. So again, thank you all and thank you, Kim, for making this happen today. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks to our amazing panelists. I learned a lot. That was a great conversation. Um, if you're new to WCET, visit our website and check us out. We have a lot of great resources on our site and blog. Um, and we do archive all of our webcasts so you can see what other timely topics and speakers we've hosted recently. Again, this was recorded and we'll send you the link and it will be on our website. Um, be sure to check out the full Reimagining the Workforce 2021 report from our partner Wiley and additional resources on their site. Um, save the date for November 2nd for our annual meeting. We'll be announcing the program and registration in early June, which is somehow next week already. Um, so we'll be working um, speedily on that and get that out shortly. Um, we will be hosting a one-day virtual meeting and some pre- and post-conference activities um, that are included with registration. I'd like to acknowledge our wonderful sponsors who underwrite our programs and events here at WCET and also our supporting members. So one final thank you to our speakers and to our participants. Uh, thank you for your great questions and engagement. Uh, take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.